I'd like to welcome everybody to the FMC quick update on flea beetles and cutworms. My name is Nolan Kowalczyk and I'm the FMC technical sales manager who covers off Alberta and Northern Saskatchewan. And with me today is also Rachel Evans, who's the uh, other technical sales manager who covers off Manitoba and Southern Saskatchewan. Today we're going to talk to you, we kind of took a little bit of a different format. I'd like to first, you know, thank you uh, for joining us. It's kind of in the middle of spring here. Um, we thought we'd take a little quick format here of using a half hour to update you on flea beetles and, and, and cutworms. And so with that, our agenda is going to be, we're going to talk about some flea beetle agronomy. We're going to talk about and then update you with pounds, talk about cutworm agronomy and the Corrigin update, and then end the presentation with a what's a bugging you program update. And so with that, to talk a little bit, just, you know, in regards to flea beetle uh, biology, you know, there's crucifer and striped flea beetles. Flea beetles in general have one generation per year. They overwinter as adults and they begin feeding um, in each kind of feeding in early May. They become active with the first extended period of warm weather in April and May. The overwintering, you know, adults begin feeding in May. The adults can emerge when the soil temperature hits 10 to 12 degrees with peak emergence of the crucifer flea beetle at 15 degrees Celsius. You know, the other, the striped flea beetles are earlier. They're generally one to four weeks earlier than the crucifer flea beetles. The striped flea beetles as adults um, are five to 11 days after this can, can emerge, five to 11 days after the spring thaw begins. Um, they're less susceptible to current seed treatment uh, control options. I'm just gonna get my uh, pointer here less susceptible to current seed treatment options, and they do favor stem feeding. Um, newer adults, so as the season progresses, overwintered adults die off in, in June or July after they complete their egg laying. And you know, from the egg to the adult development takes seven weeks. So then the new wave of adults emerge in July to October, and it is these who feed on canola leaves, stems, and seed pods in late summer, fall and October, um, and then kind of the whole uh, life cycle starts again in the following spring. So looking at some kind of overall, you know, tips for deciding when to spray flea beetles. And I think it can be easily kind of broken up into three kind of key areas, the percentage defoliation, the plant stand, the crop stage, and new leaves. So, you know, the action threshold is where greater amounts of the plants have 25% leaf defoliation. It's important to check 10, threats, 10 sites throughout the field, and feeding damage can increase to 50%, which is kind of considered the economic threshold where the insecticide provides the economic impact. And I would have to say, you know, given Today's commodity prices of high priced canola, we've never seen, you know, canola at these kind of price levels for new crop canola. You know, it's probably advantageous to be a little bit earlier on these uh, thresholds to take action to, to definitely protect uh, the canola. Um, action thresholds, you know, so looking at kind of a little bit more at plant stands. Uh, action thresholds are based on a plant stand that is, you know, these 25% action thresholds and 50% economic thresholds is based on 7 to 14 plants per square foot. So it is important for, you know, those of you represented here in different geographies and maybe having different plant stand targets or seeding rates. If the plant stands are four to five plants per square foot, then lower action thresholds should be considered. And then just kind of overlooking or taking a look at crop stage and new leaves, any conditions that slow canola development, allowing flea beetles to feed on the susceptible uh, st uh, stage of the plant, um, you know, like we've had, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next slide about frost and give you a little bit of a frost update. But I mean, any of these conditions definitely, you know, are going to, 
allow flea beetles to continue to feed. Sunny, warm, dry weather increases feeding activity. Cool, damp weather may slow the activity or drive them down to stems or underside of leaves to feed. And one other thing to mention is this, that larger than four leaf canola can withstand flea beetle feeding without any economic loss. And so this is just a look at estimating the percentage injury to the foliage of the canola, you know, flea beetle feeding damage uh, scales here. So this is kind of the 20% and the 30% defoliation and what that would look like and as we kind of emerged a 40, 50 and 60% defoliation. You know, a bit a little, we mentioned about the frost. I mean, many areas across Western Canada, um, you know, last week, over the weekend, early this week, have had predictions of frost. We have had frost. Um, and so you may have canola cotyledons that die due to frost. You know, that center growing point is probably going to be intact, and that's what you want to be watching. If the growing point has survived, watch for the damage of the flea beetle feeding now. Once it does warm up, you know, we got moisture, we got, we know there was flea beetles across Western Canada seeing the social um, media and Twitter cast and there's gonna be lots of flea beetle pressure as canola gets going here again. So watch for the damage to these newest leaves. You know, it's with these leaves being uh, much smaller that, you know, 25% leaf loss is not going to take long. So you want to be proactive, you want to be scouting, you want to be on it, have your customers ready to go, have their insecticide in place so that they can take action if they do start to see, you know, flea beetle pressure. Um, you know, also frost and reduction in leaf matter may also drive stem feeding. So there's no actual thresholds on uh, on stem feeding but it you know the widely accepted norm is if one plant per square foot you know dies as a result of stem feeding spraying should be considered you know when it's with the slow emergence or delayed growth up until now and, and early seeded acres that the to protection of the seed treatments that we have will be greatly reduced or are running out. You know, generally they're providing, you know, three, three plus weeks of control. And so with cool conditions, early seeded crops, so forth, uh, the canola laggering and not getting kind of going because of the cool conditions, that's definitely important to, 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 to keep scouting and watching because the, the, the flea beetle damage is going to start to occur. And so now just to shift gears and give you a bit more product specifics with pounce. So pounce, uh, 384EC, has a new registration for both striped and crucifer flea beetles. It's one of the only insecticides that has both striped and crucifer flea beetles on its label. So the active is permethrin, it's a group three, it's highly concentrated, it's a synthetic perethroid, and it really, the best results are when the product is sprayed and when it comes in contact with the pest, but it does have some stomach or ingestion activity. It does need good water volume of 10 gallons an acre. So it comes in a two by 10 liter case. It's registered in canola for flea beetles and talk a little bit about cutworms and other crops in a second. Uh, the rate is 62 and a half mils per acre or 160 acres per 10 liter jug. It was very economical at $4 an acre. The best results are when targeting the flea beetles when they are actively feeding so that you can kind of spray and come in contact with them. It can be applied via air once per season and it has the unique characteristic of having a longer stability in sunlight. And so, you know, what we see with permethrin or pounce is that it has longer control based on a longer photolysis or light stability average half-life. So based on research that was conducted at the University of Manitoba and the Pittsburgh Environmental Research Lab, pounce has light, uh, had a higher light stability than Matador, Desis, and Lorsban. And so as you can see here, Lorsban being the standard, Desis at three times, uh, Lorsban, Matador at five times, but Pounce being seven times, having a seven times longer light stability than 
did check as, as Lohr's band. And so what that's kind of translating to with insecticides, you know, degrading with both by moisture and light. So if they all degrade somewhat equally by moisture, with pounds having a greater light stability, it's there a little bit longer for insects and pests that come in contact with the product. As well to mention is that it is stable in water and in, 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 in up to a pH of nine. And so just a couple visuals here. You know, we do see excellent control of both striped and crucifer flea beetle. And you'll see here in a, in a uh, uh, side by side trial that we had in Arburg, Manitoba, uh, last year, which was, you know, primarily a striped flea beetle population. Seven days after, we see pounce at 160 acres uh, per 10 liter jug, the recommended rate, versus untreated. And so, as you, you know, you'll see here, I mean, high flea beetle population, the uh, flea beetles ravaged the untreated side, but you'll see, you can see the canola coming through. The pounce was able to kind of hold back and ward off uh, the flea beetle attack on uh, on on the emerging canola leaves. And you know, one other thing just to mention, and Rachel's gonna talk a bit more here about cutworms in a, in a second here, but we do see longer, uh, you know, good cutworm activity with this product, with pounds, proven stability for soil applications, registered in canola, sunflowers, uh, cereals, corn, flax, lentils, peas, potatoes, and more, recommended use rate of 125 mils or 80 acres per 10 liter jug at an SRP of $8 an acre. And you'll see here, this was a Twitter a couple of years back that was put on where a customer used the pounce and this was really impressed with all of these uh, um, dead cutworms that they were able to kind of see the following day. And as well, you know, just to highlight kind of the, the ability of the longer control with the longer light stability that we see over some of the other peritheroids. This was a study that we did, the percentage of cut stems. So in this study, pounce was applied at planting uh, of canola. And uh, then basically 10 days after the percentage of cut stems were measured. So as the canola was emerging, and as we see here, pounce, only had 1.1% of the population of cut stems. Chlorpyrifos was 13% and the untreated was 75%. So as you see here, you know, Pounce definitely had a good level of activity and had the least amount of cut stems versus uh, Lorisvan or Chlorpyrifos type products and obviously a lot better than the untreated. And I will now uh, pass it over to uh, Rachel to take us through the next segment with Corgin. Thanks, Nolan. Um, you can sw switch over to the next slide, please. Um, so we kind of are, you know, segued into cutworms here a little bit um, with Nolan in the last couple slides. Um, and so just before we get into specifics on Corrigin, wanted to just do a quick review, I guess, of some scouting and management tips. Um, just to kind of set the stage for, for our um, conversation on Corrigin. So cutworms, obviously, you know, they're the larval stages of several types of moss that we have in the prairies. Um, they're going to be overwintering as eggs or as larvae. Um, so early detection is crucial. Um, depending on the species, you know, they could be overwintering in that form um, that is then going to cause damage to our crops. Um, once they hatch or once they get going in the spring, they'll typically have five to seven instars before pupating. Um, and so that means that earlier in their life cycle, when they're still small, they're still in those earlier instars, um, they're going to be causing more damage. And so a, a general rule of thumb is that once they reach 1.2 to 1.5 inches in length, that they're going to be close to pupating, which means that control may no longer be warranted because they're starting to slow down um, in preparation for that next stage of their life cycle. Other thing to point out here as well is just that warm temperatures are going to favor more rapid development through those instar phases. So you could see this happening more quickly in a warm spring. Um, know your species. So um, depending on where you are, we've got people from all across the prairies on the call this morning. Um, so some species are going to be primarily below ground feeders like our pale western or glassy cutworms. Um, and some species may be above ground or a combination of below and, and above ground, um, you know, something like red-backed, dingy, or dark-sided, feeding primarily above ground. 
And so that's going to play a role in terms of what we're looking for um, in terms of the injury rate. So whether they're missing plants or it's more of a wilted, notched or gouged um, holes in plants. Um, of course, looking for bare spots uh, in the field. In some cases, when we've got um, more topography in the field, you might see them show up on south facing slopes first, uh, where soils are a bit warmer. Um, and then once we do kind of have some suspect areas, right, it's just about digging around with your trowel, trying to scoop up some soil into a container, sometimes into a bucket just to shake loose any potential larvae is a, is a good trick. Um, and, and then just a final note here that, of course, because these are moths, that they are nocturnal. Um, and that means that during the heat of the day, they're going to be moving down into those cooler, dark soils. Um, so scouting may be, uh, may be easier, you know, early in the day or, or into the evening when they're getting closer to the soil surface again. Go to the next slide, please, Nolan. Thanks. And so um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here. Um, so obviously thresholds have been established in, um, for some, but not all of our cutworm species. And in some cases are, you know, they're economic thresholds for our crops. In other cases, they're more nominal. Um, the Egg Canada Cutworm Guide, if you don't have it saved onto your phone or printed off from Prairie Pest uh, Monitoring Network is a wonderful resource. So certainly recommend that you check that out. But I think just generally when you look at this and we think about what Nolan said about commodity prices this spring in terms of, you know, these being sometimes an economic threshold, um, we think about our crop species that we're growing in a particular area, certainly, um, you know, crops that have a lower physiological ability to, spill, to fill in space in a plant stand, um, something like sunflowers or dry beans, for example, the tolerance for feeding is a lot lower than, say, something like um, canola or, or wheat barley oats. So just something to keep in mind when we're scouting and, and thinking about managing cutworms. Next slide. All right, um, so what is Corrigin insecticide? Corrigin is a group 28 insecticide. The active ingredient is chlorine trinopole. Um, this is sometimes also, you'll see trademarked as Rhinaxapir. So that's just the trademark for the active ingredient. And this group 28 class of insecticides is really unique. Um, Corrigin specifically, you know, uh, really kind of changed the game in terms of its unique environmental and ecotoxological uh, eco profile. That's a mouthful in the morning. Um, but the group 28s, they control chewing insects, so the Lepidoptera order. Um, yeah, and they are going to be working on all the way through your life cycle. So it's ovicidal. Uh, larvicidal, and it's, depending on the species, will control adults as well. This is ingestion-based, so um, that's a, a total, you know, change in mindset really for for handling insecticides. Is that uh, insects do need to consume treated tissue in order to get that product into them, but once they do, feeding will stop in as little as seven minutes. Next slide. So just a few quick hitters here on Corrigin. Um, so with that unique um, environmental profile, it affords us a very short pre-harvest interval. So it's one day for canola cereals and pulses. So very um, you know, important and handy as we think about some of our later season pests. It's a 12 hour re-entry period. Um, this is a residual product. Um, the residual can be 7 to 21 days. This is going to be rate dependent and also um, environmental and sort of time of year dependent as well. Um, Corrigin is not systemic. It will not move from treated areas of the plant to untreated areas. However, it is translaminar. So it will move from one side of a leaf that's been sprayed to the other side of the leaf. So that's going to be very important um, you know, for, for targeting something like cutworms early in the season, but also later season pests like, say, diamondback moth that are going to be laying their eggs on the other sides, on the undersides of leaves, for example. Works well in hot weather, very stable in the tank, very tank mixable, um, just really easy to use in terms of, um, you know, a, an insecticide. Next slide. All right, so in terms of this residual, you know, what does that mean for our growers? Um, having uh, that 7 to 21 days, depending on the rate, um, means that you're going to have, you know, a bit more forgiveness in terms of 
you know, trying to cover more acres or just, um, you know, peace of mind if we're dealing with insects that are moving, um, for example, grasshoppers that are moving in from adjacent areas of the field, um, that type of thing. In the context of cutworms, it means that we have the ability to spray day or night. And certainly in the last um, several weeks, we've been, you know, had lots and lots of windy days. Um, and so our spray times are are pretty limited, right? And so if you have something with a residual, you know, it, it you know means that we can be spraying at the most opportune times um, based on the conditions, and that you're not having to wait until the evening to target something like cutworms. Um, again, it is ingestion based, so I'll just reiterate that. Um, because we are looking for good plant coverage, high water volume, so looking for 10 gallons of water volume an acre, um, high pressure, just really trying to make sure that we're gonna get all parts of that plant with um, good coverage. And then in terms of, um, you know, that residual showed the seven to 21 days. Um, and if you are looking at spraying something like earth armyworm later, later in the season where you have the option of going with um, you know, several different registered rates. The general rule of thumb is gonna be use higher rates when you're dealing with larger insects, you have higher pressure, or you're looking for a longer extended control period. So that's just one way of, of kind of navigating through that um, rate selection. With cutworms, we just have the one rate. So it's 100 mils an acre or 60 acres a jug. Um, SRP is 22.56 an acre. Um, and so with cutworms, uh, one thing just to keep in mind is again, because it's an ingestion based product, um, it means that you're not gonna have that, um, that complete death immediately that growers might be used to. However, what you'll see is 24, 24 hours after spring, those cutworms are gonna be lethargic, they're gonna be slow moving. Um, and when you pick them up and touch them, they're not going to form that really tight C. Um, and so that's a good way of, of you know, knowing and, and showing your growers that the product is working. And then with that 100 mil rate, um, that, that product will remain in the plants for at least seven days. And so that is, you know, of course, beneficial in terms of reducing the need to, to respray. Um, and so just kind of wrapping up here, so when we think about corage and impounts and tank mixes, of course, trying to save our growers time as they're traveling across fields. Um, so corrigin is an SC formulation and pounce is an EC formulation. So um, following wham legs, you can sort of slot, slot in corrigin or pounce um, into that tank mix order. Um, a couple common questions that we get asked um, is with the Liberty Centurion tank mix. So there um, you can see the Amiga goes in first, and then with Corrigin, it would go second as the SC, followed by Liberty and Centurion. And in the case of Pounce, um, again, Amigo goes in first, and then you would have Li Liberty, Centurion, and then Pounce would go in last as the EC. So then just lastly, as a summary, um, this is a great one if you want to grab your phone and take a picture of it. Um, it just kind of lays out everything about these two products side by side. Um, and so, you know, with Corrigin um, versus Pounce, as we think about flea beetles and cutworms, so Corrigin will not control flea beetles. Um, Corrin trying to pull that group 28 active will not. Um, I know there's sometimes confusion because there, there's another um, seed treatment that's a group 28, like in Lumiderm, for example, but that is cyan trinipole, not chloran trinipole. So just uh, a note of confusion there. But um, so Corrigin will not control flea beetles, but it is an option for cutworms. Pounce is registered, of course, for crucifer and striped flea beetles, as well as cutworm control. With Corrigin, you have an extended control period, so seven to 10 days at that 100 mil rate um, versus you know, some limited extended control with Pounce. And as Nolan has explained, we, we're seeing more than some other um, insecticides in that class. Um, with Corrigin, very safe on beneficial insects and pollinators. It's one of the very unique things about Corrigin that makes it so nice to use um, is just that environmental and ecotoxic profile. 
pounce as a pyrethroid. Um, and so it is going to impact our beneficials and pollinators. So we need to think about that when we're spraying. Corrigin, ingestion-based um, pounce, more contact with some limited ingestion. So one is going to be something where you're going to you know, see some of those insects still moving shortly after application, but they're going to stop feeding right away. Pounce is that quick knockdown. Um, with Corrigin, you have um, flexibility in terms of your spray time because of that residual period. With Pounce, you're wanting to spray um, in the evening time because you are looking for contact. Um, in terms of timing, Corrigin, any time, Pounce, only up to the five leaf stage. Uh, and then Corrigin, you know, no temperature restrictions, Pounce, um, because again, pyrethroid, we're wanting to avoid applications during the heat of the day. And just the last two points here, uh, water volume for both. We're looking for as much water as we can here, really 10 gallons an acre um, for good coverage. And then just a final point for um, you know, stewardship um, with Corrigin, uh, because we do have some group 28 seed treatments that it's good practice um, and on our label that we shouldn't follow a group 28 seed treatment with, um, with a group 28 foliar insecticide within 60 days. Um, with pounds, of course, there's no restrictions. And so um, just lastly here, and this is in the handout section for those of you who joined in a bit later. Um, so back by popular demand, we are um, rolling with our What's Bugging You program for 2021. Um, and so the way this works is for when growers buy two 10 liter jugs of pounds, that they'll, re they'll receive $120 um, back per jug rebate on any and all of their Corrigin. And so, you know, great option um, when we're dealing with um, multiple insects throughout the season, you know, um, we're not tying anybody into using one brand um, over the other or for mixing the two together. Um, they can use their pounce early in the season on flea beetles and get a rebate, for example, on their courage. And if they've got any grasshoppers or, you know, there happens to be a, a Diamondback or Bertha run. And of course, your account, local FMC account manager is going to know way more on the details than I do. So I direct them um, if you've got any further questions on that, as I'm sure they've, they have already. And so um, if there are any questions, be happy to answer them. Um, thank you again so much for your time. We hope that uh, this you know, gave you a quick um, run through of pounce and Corrigin just in time for, you know, as these pests start to uh, make their appearance.